Join me today in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 1. We are in the introductory part of this chapter. And we begin in verse 1 in 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I come to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is, uh, and my trade is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift, God, uh, gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. And verse seven is our focused verse. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. Last week we spoke about the Christian call to Christian courage. Today it's the call to Christian power. That God gives us the ability to start and to sustain. Amen. And Paul was giving that same charge to Timothy for his role of pastoring this church in Ephesus. During the 18th century, a great move of God took place called the Great Awakening. God gave power to various men to preach and thousands were drawn to Christ. John Wesley and George Whitfield were two of the more well-known men of God used during this movement, but there were many, many, many others. Names that we do not recognize today, but were used mightily by God. One of those men, his name was William Grimshaw. He was used by God in some anointed ways. And John Wesley once said of him, If such a man as Grimshaw would, uh, would have a many men like him, our nation would tremble because he carries the fire of God with him wherever he goes. So John Wesley was talking about the Holy Spirit of God that gripped this man named uh, John Grimshaw who was unknown to us today, but he was a mighty warrior of God during the Great Awakening. And I want you to know that God wants your life and my life to be captivated and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God so we can change our worlds as well. Now you may not be a mighty preacher, you may not be a, a mighty missionary, but God wants to use your one and only life empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to make an eternal difference. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 6, there's a testimony about the early church. Those who were critics, those who were opponents said that they have turned the world upside down. That they turned the world for Jesus Christ. That because they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that they were controlled by power, that they were walking in unity, that they were sharing the gospel, they changed the world around them. And friends, we need another movement of God just like that. Amen? Amen. We don't need to turn the world upside down. We need to turn the world right side up. We need to let the world see God through the power of the Holy Spirit alive and well in our own lives. Now, Paul was a powerful man. A preacher from years gone by, Martin Lloyd-Jones, quoted this about Paul. Paul was like a volcano. There is a power, fire within him, moving him, energizing him, carrying him along in the performance of his great and high calling. 
Friends, I want you to know that is not just for the Apostle Paul. That's not just for the preachers of the Great Awakening. That is a movement of God in your life that God wants for you. He wants to carry you along. The Christian life is not supposed to be a drudgery. It should not feel like you're running in mud or quicksand. It should feel like you're being moved along by the Holy Spirit. That you have joy. That you have passion. That you have excitement in your life. Not every single day. Some days are, uh, are better than others, but God wants us to sense the Holy Spirit alive and well inside of our lives. Paul, when he spoke about his ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said the power of his ministry was not his persuasive words or his human wisdom, but the demonstration of the Spirit of God and the power thereof in his life. Friends, is there any evidence of God in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit that's giving you the strength, giving you the ability, making you different to a watching world? When people see your life, they see you as just holding on, or they see you as being empowered by God's Spirit, being used by the mighty force of God to have a mighty impact for God. That is the charge to you, to me, to the Mission Church today. Francis Schaeffer said this, because the world is hard, confronting it without God's power is an overwhelming prospect. Friends, I want you to know that you need the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit of God, according to Romans chapter 8. And you cannot live the victorious Christian life without the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not talking about the outlandish things that come into controversy and criticism because the Holy Spirit of God. I'm just talking about good biblical Christianity. Amen? Living a life that's honoring and empowered by God that you cannot do it on your own strength even your own discipline, though those are good, you need the Holy Spirit of God working in and through and with you. But now we live in a time, as 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, that we live in a day where there is godliness, but they deny the power thereof. There's a lot of religion, amen? There's a lot of ways that man tries to reach up to God. Rituals and things that you go through, but there's no power of God on that. Friends, we want something better than that. Amen? We want to see the powerful working of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, in our families, inside of our church. That's the only way that we will be able to see God do the things that are exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can even begin to ask or think. J. Vernon McGee, a conservative preacher of the Word for many years. Uh, if you've ever rode the Bible bus with J. Vernon McGee, amen. Yeah, in his 80s, he was close to the end of his life. He was preaching at a commencement ceremony at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he said this, if I were to start my ministry all over again, he said, I would give more attention to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, teaching and leading people to depend daily upon Him. Again, we're not talking about the crazy things that can be applied to the Holy Spirit. There are some crazy things that happen, barking like dogs, laughing hysterically, running around the church and acting a fool. We're talking about just living a godly life through the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is not about how high you jump or how loud you, you shout. It's about how straight you walk. Amen? Are you living a life that's pleasing and honoring and surrendered to God? You cannot do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Be not drunk with wine, <clears throat> where is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Hey, that is a command given by God. You are to be actively filled by the Holy Spirit. And it gives you a comparison that being filled by the Holy Spirit is the positive sense uh, reflects what God wants to control our lives, our actions, our words, and our attitudes. 
which the devil uses alcohol and drugs as a poor substitute for that. But just as it's clear when someone is intoxicated or inebriated by the way they slur their speech, the way they stumble around, where they act a fool, the Holy Spirit of God wants to do the same thing in our lives. It changes the way we talk, changes the way we live. It shows that we are on fire for God and there's something outside of us that's controlling our lives. Friends, that's what the Holy Spirit of God wants to do in your life. The Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 16, Walk in the Spirit that you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Friends, this is the only way that you'll ever have victory over the sin in your life. It's the only way that you'll ever overcome your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups. This is the only way that you'll be able to pull through the things the devil wants to use to hold you down. It's not white knuckling it. It's not just your discipline. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit of God to take control of your life and then you walk daily in it. Now you use your holy habits. You read the Word of God. You pray. You worship God. You do the things that you're taught uh, as spiritual disciplines and holy habits. But it's the Holy Spirit of God that will make a difference in your Christian life. It says in Luke chapter 9 verse 1. That when Jesus called His 12 disciples, He gave them power. Now, friends, you are a disciple of Christ if you are a believer in Jesus. Amen? A disciple simply means a learner and a follower. Now, there were some unique things that God gave His first apostles, but it says here His disciples. We are disciples today. There are no apostles today in the title. There are apostles in that we are sent on commission, but we are all disciples. And it says that Jesus, when He called you when he calls us he gives us power and that power is not some mystical thing that power has a name and his name is the Holy Spirit amen it's not just an influence it's not just some abstract concept he is a person he's a third part of the Trinity who comes to take up residence in your life the moment you trust in Jesus Christ now, there's some teaching out there that you need a, a second baptism, a second anointing, a second filling of the Holy Spirit of God. As I read Scripture, I do not see that. I see it this way. The moment you trust Christ, whenever that was, for me it was the fall of 1999. I got, you got, all of the Holy Spirit of God. He does not come in degrees. He's the full person that comes into your life. Now the rest of your life is giving Him all of you. Amen? It's a life of surrender, of yieldedness, giving Him every inch of your life. And it's a lifelong process and a lifelong journey. The Bible says in John 16, 7, Right before Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, He said this, It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. That's a profound statement. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, 100% man, 100% God, the one who could walk on water and feed the multitudes, the one who spoke like no other, the one who was God in flesh. He said it was better for his disciples then and today that he goes away, goes back to the Father in heaven to set the right hand to pray for us because when he did that, he then sent his Holy Spirit not just to be Jesus, God with us. We now have the Holy Spirit, God inside of us. You will never be a God, but you can be like God. Amen. The Bible says the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. 1 Peter 1.16 says you should be holy as God is holy. You cannot be holy apart from the Holy Spirit's work and power inside of your life. 
Friends, this is not a secondary issue. This is a primary issue. We cannot act like the Holy Spirit is not alive and well. Friends, you cannot live the robust Christian life. A church is going to be dead and cold. Our lives are going to be empty and incomplete unless we let the Holy Spirit of God do what the Holy Spirit of God is designed to do within us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 14 through 16, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we can cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Friends, this is a difference maker between religion and relationship. It's a difference maker between you just working your best to be a good person and supernaturally being transformed and empowered by God living inside of you. Let me give you some things to think about today, some points about the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit makes us more like Christ. He makes us more like Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hey, God uses three things to transform us and to grow us to be more like Christ. He uses the Word of God. He uses the Spirit of God. And He uses the people of God. Amen? And the Holy Spirit is involved in all of those. The Holy Spirit is the primary author of the Word of God. He used about 40 different human authors that were inspired, God-breathed, but the Holy Spirit is the capital A author. And God uses the Holy Spirit to teach us. We'll learn just a matter of moments that when you're reading in the Bible, the Holy Spirit makes the difference. The Holy Spirit's what takes this word and applies it to your heart and doesn't just allow it to be information, but it turns into transformation. The Holy Spirit is again living inside of you. So it takes some biblical truth and brings it alive and gives you the enabling or the power to live that out inside of your life. And then the people of God, it's the Holy Spirit and the other people of God that God uses to develop us and to build us. As we're saying, and we'll continue to say, mission groups are going to be such an important part of our discipleship strategy. He's going to bring you into contact with other believers where you're going to be able to allow the working of the Holy Spirit in your lives to take the next spiritual step of obedience as individuals. But I can tell you, God loves individuals, but His plan is always for community. And He wants believers to walk and to live together for spiritual maturation and an impact to the world around them. If you are not going to be in a mission group, I encourage you, I challenge you, I implore you to think deeply about that because you're going to be missing out on what God wants to do in your life and in the mission church. Hey, sanctification is the process of the Holy Spirit stripping away our sinful habits and bringing us into holiness. Think of it as peeling back an onion. There are layers. The Holy Spirit works in us by peeling away our sinful characteristics and replacing them with godly characteristics. Friends, I really want you every week, really every day, to evaluate your life. The Bible says examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith. Make sure you're saved, but then also make sure that you are growing. That God should be doing a work in your life. That there's always something that God should be dealing with you with. There's always a next spiritual step of obedience. Something God wants you to give up for His glory. Something God wants you to start doing for His honor. A mindset you're supposed to change. A habit you're supposed to break. A new thing that you're supposed to pursue. 
God is always wanting to do something with you. If you're bored, if you're lazy, if you're apathetic, if you're lukewarm in your faith, there is a problem that God is always wanting to stretch us, always wanting to grow us, always take us into uncomfortable and the unknown because that's whenever your faith is required and when you're out operating and exercising your faith, that's when you're pleasing God. Amen? And the Holy Spirit is the one that makes us more like Christ. Number two, the Holy Spirit gives us power to witness. The Holy Spirit gives us power to witness. On that, uh, on that little book of Acts, first chapter, uh, verse 8, one of our theme verses we talk about here, Jesus says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, don't try to do ministry in your own strength. You do ministry once the Holy Spirit of God has come upon you. You see, the Holy Spirit of God's mandate and mission of that spirit is for world evangelism. And God chooses to use us in that process amen that you are filled with the holy spirit of god for a purpose and that's to take the gospel to your family to your friends to your neighbors and around the world it reminds me of a uh, a guy who uh, came up to his friends and said you'll be happy for me i remembered my first day training i had recently they said well how do you know you remembered he said i came home the other day and someone had a terrible accident in front of my house they had ran their car to a telephone pole they were ejected through the windshield there was blood there was gore it was horrible it was overwhelming but i remembered my first day training he said how so he said well i sat down i put my head between my knees and started to take deep breaths so i wouldn't pass out all right hey the church can't be like that amen we can't just sit down and pretend like everything is okay people are dying not just physically but spiritually they're separated from a holy god they're making a mess of their life the needs are overwhelming we can't do everything but we can do something amen and the holy spirit of god inside you that's empowering you to be a witness that you don't have to have a moniker you don't have to have a title you don't have to have a position to be a witness for god every christian filled with the holy spirit is to witness to a dying and a desperate world around them number three the holy spirit guides us into all truth the Holy Spirit is our guide into all truth. John 16, verse 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit is a, is a beautiful example of surrender to God the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the, not the one on the main float of the parade. The Holy Spirit is the one that's sitting on the side, pointing to Jesus and saying, Everybody, let's honor Him. Let's worship Him. Let's applaud Him. I can tell you the Holy Spirit doesn't bring attention to Himself. He always deflects the attention to Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit of God is inside of you, which He is as a Christian, that's what He's doing in you. You're not drawing attention to yourself. What a great person you are. What, how spiritual you are. What kind of parent you are. What kind of employee you are. You're drawing your attention that bounces off you and points to Jesus. Amen? That's what the Spirit of God will do inside of you without the Spirit of God. You can do nothing, Charles Spurgeon said. We are ships without wind, branches without sap, coals without fire. We are useless. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said it better than I ever could. Friends, we need the Holy Spirit of God to point us to the truth and to live out that truth in our life. Number four, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Yeah. Hey, the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of our sin. John 16, 8 says, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
Christian conviction is our friend, not our enemy. That conviction is given by God for His purpose. Just like pain is a warning sign in our life, put your hand on a hot top of an oven. You know to take your hand off without the pain. You keep your hand on there until you are permanently injured. Well, conviction should be the same way. When conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, says that's wrong. You should not be saying that. You should not be doing that. You should not be spending your money there. You should be building that relationship. You shouldn't be viewing that. You should not be thinking that. That's God's way of giving you an opportunity to stop and cease. Amen? Amen. To refocus your life. To go God's way and not your way. But here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. He does not shout to us. He whispers to us. He will not beat you over the head. He will not use a bullhorn. But He will speak in a loving voice. But you can choose not to listen. You say, well, why doesn't God shout to me? He speaks and whispers because He wants you close to Him. Amen? Amen. He doesn't want you to stay far away so you just barely hear Him yelling at you. He wants you to be eager and up close saying, Holy Spirit, I want to hear from you. If I'm wrong, teach me. If I'm right, encourage me. Help me. You are my helper. You are my counselor. I am unable to live this Christian life apart from you. So you're eager and you're listening and you're attentive. You have your spiritual antenna up and you're turned to the right station. You're allowing the Holy Spirit to give you your marching orders. Now know, my friends, temptation is not the sin. That whenever you are tempted, you're like Jesus. Satan tempted Jesus, but Jesus overcame the temptation by faith, by Scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same formula that God wants to use in your life so that you can have victory over temptation. You do not have to fall prey to the temptation, to the sin in your life. You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. We say we're not perfect and we are not perfect and we will never be perfect. We'll never be sinless, but we should be sinning less. Amen. If you're walking in the Spirit of God, you should be able to go seasons of time, hours, days, maybe even a few days without having sin, overt, outward sin in your life. Because you've got the Spirit of God living inside of you. You're not a victim to sin. You are a victor over it. God does not want you living under your circumstances, but riding high on top of them. Number five, the Holy Spirit reveals God's Word. To us. Holy Spirit reveals God's word to us. John 14, 26 says this, uh, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things <clears throat> and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Hey, I know that I'm preaching to you today, that you're hearing my words, but if anything happens inside of you that really matters, that's really sustaining, that's really life-changing or transformational, the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God and applies it to your heart and to your mind. Whenever you're reading the Bible, it's God's Spirit that is bringing those words alive off the page and applying them to your heart. But we've got to be listening to what the Spirit is saying. Remind you of a park ranger at the Yellowstone National Park. He was leading a group of hikers, and he was so excited about telling them about the flowers and the animals that he considered the message on his two-way radio distracting. So he switched it off. As the group neared the tower, the ranger was met by a nearly breathless lookout who asked why he had, how he had not responded to the messages on his radio. He said a grizzly bear has been stalking the group and the authorities were trying to warn them of the danger. Anytime we tune out the Holy Spirit or ignore the warnings of the Bible, we put ourselves and others at risk around us. And six, finally... The Holy Spirit brings us closer to other believers. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Friends, when there is a unity inside of diversity, that is an evidence of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. 
Whenever God brings people inside of a church, no matter what size they may be, whether they're running thousands or hundreds or tens, and there can be unity inside of that church, that is an evidence of the Holy Spirit of God. That we're all going to have difference of opinions. We're all going to have different perspectives. We're going to all have different uh, preferences. But when the person of the Holy Spirit is alive and well inside of us, we tend to walk in a unified mindset because we want God glorified. We want the lost reached. And we want to encourage one another. F.B. Myers reported us said of his experience, I left the prayer meeting and crept away praying, Oh Lord, if there is ever a man who needs the power of the Holy Spirit, it is I. But I do not know how to receive Him. I am too tired, too worn out, too nervous, too, too tired to agonize over this any longer. The voice said to him, As you look for forgiveness from the hand of the dying Christ, Take the Holy Spirit from the hand of the living Christ. So you may be here saying, well, how do I do this, Pastor Donovan? How do I allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in my life? How can I live out this kind of power in my daily existence? Well, it says so simply, just as you receive by faith your salvation, daily, moment by moment, receive by faith the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Ask Him routinely, Holy Spirit, Fill me and control me. Holy Spirit, I am yielded to you. Then whenever He speaks to you, and sometimes you may have a hard time distinguishing between your voice and the Holy Spirit's voice. That's why you walk so close with God. That's why you're so full of Scripture that the two become one. Amen? And you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your steps. Oh Lord, you want me to do that? Hey, you don't want me to go there? Hey, I should make this choice today? God, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. Holy Spirit, empower me now to do it. Friends, the Holy Spirit is resident in your life. The question today is this. Is He president of your life? If not, today, right now, this time of invitation, it would be a great time to give Him His rightful place. Let's pray together. Heads bowed.